Aurelia. I mean, there's a lot of options here for first pick. You already brought it up, Azale. There's Rise. There's a ton of the powerful flex picks in currently in meta that are still on the board. But for now, it looks like it's a debate between whether will you prioritize one of those Salula lanes or whether you prioritize Meliodas. And the Jarvan, of course, still a flex pick itself, but most likely going into the hands of Meliodas. Yeah, we're expecting it to go to Meliodas. This does mean Akali and Aurelia still available here. Both those were banned out in game number one. We'll be interested to see if TL even cares about those picks or if they you know, will grab them up for themselves here. If they want to hide picks, you certainly can look for something like jungle support or even jungle uh, and bot. So Kai'Sa looking like the takeaway from Big Koro did have, I think, a, a really strong game one on it. You know, both through laning phase, surviving against Lucian Braum, certainly had help with all of that jungle pressure, uh, but also did look really good in the late game team fighting. So now Double is securing a little bit of scaling for himself. Skarner was banned out in phase two in game number one. Smithy wants to be able to grab it up earlier perhaps here, but Silas also on the table and is a strong pick. So Silas will get locked in. Of course, I think no surprise to see Liquid debating whether or not they need to pick a jungler here as, you know, once again, Core JJ and Nick Smithy, the catalyst for most of Team Liquid's plays were heavily limited in the previous pick ban. For now though, the Silas flex pick itself will be taken. PPB have to make their final selections here in the first phase. Will they prioritize an AD carry for Big Koro? Will they allow that to potentially get banned out in the second phase? Of course, no longer have the luxury of counter picking their final pick on red side. Yeah, they're going to go Relia. Was taken away from them in game number one in that ban phase, so are going to grab it up. And Jensen has not had any plays of Salas throughout this year. It has only been one game for impact. He did perform pretty well on it, kind of acting as a pseudo frontline, playing Aftershock. Silas does fit his style fairly well, but that is not to say this could not be going mid lane for TL. They will grab up the Varus though. So flex pick in the Aurelia, jungler likely locked down with the J4. Varus will be going bot for big Koro. TL do have an opportunity to secure their own support here and then try to target the support pool if they want to go that route. Now the Nautilus being hovered, this is another champion that has been considered a flex pick over the course of the tournament, mostly a mid laner, but has been used in the support position as well. Yeah, and it's going to get locked in, so you are expecting it to be AP Nautilus mid, but as you say, it can be flexed. And, you know, one of the teams that a lot of people were looking at as a potential team to kind of use more of these tanks as they receive buffs is TL, right? This certainly could be a Nautilus top theoretically for impact. Those buffs do still help that champion in the 1v1. I do believe that Nautilus can do quite fine into Aurelia. Very hard for Aurelia to actually navigate some of these team fights to be dashing around through the minions, the passive route, very effective at locking her down for any potential jungle ganks. Um, but as of now, I would expect this to be a Silas top, to be a Nautilus mid. Still, on the side of PvB, you have to give consideration to the fact that they could be moved around. And a lot of potential engage already on both sides. You know, the freedom for Silas to steal both the Cataclysm as well as Varus' mm -hmm. ultimate puts him in a very good position to get things kicked off when paired with the Nautilus. So I imagine we may see more explosive fights across this game. And we check in on the bands. Of course, Skarner once again. Xmithy's champion pool is being targeted here. Rise will be banned away on the opposite side. I think TL feeling a little bit more comfortable that it is the jungle Jarvan and will now target a different role instead, limiting the flex pick opportunities on blue side by taking away the Rise. Yeah, it's interesting seeing Kane having so much of a discussion there with Jensen, which does lead me to believe that, you know, he, it is going to be probably the mid lane Nautilus not flex to the support, you know, asking Jensen, hey, what are the matchups you are most worried about perhaps on the Nautilus would be my assumption there taking away that LeBlanc that Null did play last game, performed quite well. Jensen certainly equal to the task during the laning phase, but Null had some strong team fighting. Yeah, I found a couple of those key picks onto the sideline. The Sejuani, though, now taken away, giving a okay. lot of respect over to Smithy and his uh, comfort picks. Yeah, I mean, Lee available here, Olaf available, Rek'Sai is still up. You know, that is what they traded out for the Sejuani. Band. So a lot of these bands have just been kind of flexed based on the performances in game number one, saying, hey, maybe this pick deserves a little bit more respect than we originally anticipated. And it was, I mean, very difficult for them to navigate those team fights. And as soon as the skirmish started to turn against them, Sejuani kind of just compounded that advantage for the opposite side. But the Rek'Sai will be picked mm -hmm. up. So a lot of early game power here on both sides with the Jarvan as well as the Rek'Sai. Support, of course, waiting to be picked in, as well as another follow-up solo laner. Have to imagine if the Shen is locked in, it will be a support for Null or for Big Coral on the bottom side. But still, I feel more creative picks have yet to be seen on patch 9.8. Yeah, it's, it's certainly possible to go top, but does see a lot more play in the support role. Rek'Sai going to be working very well. There's already quite a lot of gank assistance. You know, when you look at the Nautilus, when you look at the Silas, both these guys can set up for the jungler quite effectively. 
and Rek'Sai is very strong in those early levels, especially from ahead, can be an absolute monster. And now some debate. We see the Camille swap back and forth, of course. Okay. Zoe's still one of the most comfortable blind pickable champions I think we've seen from many mid laners internationally, especially with Lissandra kind of being taken off the board for a few nerfs. So played a small bit, but Zoe now locked in. We'll commit the Aureli to the top side of the map and the Zoe to the mid lane. And now to find out if anything is going kind of unexpectedly for TL. Are they gonna flex anything around? And if that Akali does get locked in, we are gonna see Nautilus support here. So that would be that flex. Uh, Gangplank, the option. Gangplank is actually one of the best picks, I think, for impact. He is so, so strong on this champion, really adept at actually surviving through that lane phase, getting to those later stages. It works so well with his play style because TL often is not playing to the top side of the map. This would mean that impact can just farm it out, survive, utilize his ultimate down to the bottom side of the map, trying to get double lift ahead. That is very often what they are looking for. Now we're seeing some uh, last minute swap arounds, but this does look like how things are going to be locked in. I'm still expecting it to be uh, Impact Gangplank. I think they're just kind of trolling around a little bit with <laughs> with uh, the pick order there. And Flex picks is an addiction, man. You just keep you keep swapping until 20 second, yeah. seconds, and you uh, you take it wherever it lands. And there it is. It is locked in. So you know, certainly going to be very strong. You know, for Smithy, I think to be playing around bot and mid. That is certainly where he's likely going to look to go, simply because that is where he's going to be easily set up by the Silas, by the Nautilus. You also have to remember that every time CC is applied, that is an additional plasma stack for the Kai'Sa. So there's some nice synergy there with the Nautilus and the Kai'Sa. You have that point and click Nautilus ultimate onto champions such as the Zoe, which is going to allow for not only people to be able to actually dive in and try to follow up, but double if to activate his ultimate to try to fly in and, and knock people down in those team fights. But I think a lot of this will be about can Zeros actually get ahead of Impact. I think if you cannot punish the Gangplank, if Impact is in his comfort zone, farming it out, playing carefully, you know, not really being punished, he's going to be using those ultimates on other lanes over and over and over for those kind of three, four-man plays that we are expecting TL to make on the bottom and middle side of the map. And with two early game junglers as well, it feels like the gauntlet has been thrown down as we enter game two. Fong Vu Buffalo on the blue side, Team Liquid one game up on the red. We can turn our attention to the top lane and to the fans in the crowd, Liquid fans. Once again, showing up in force. A lot of concerns from the players that they might be playing in a library. <laughs> of course, Fong Vu Buffalo, no doubt, the hometown favorites. And I mean, I, I just want to see Aurelia versus GP Impact, I think, Kind of legendary for neutralizing a lot of these aggressive matchups, mm -hmm. and can he do the same up against Cirrus? I think a lot of his, his best historic performances have actually been on the GP in North America, where he is able to absorb a ton of pressure. Uh, PVB, looking like they may get caught out, but Taunt going to be leveled. So, you know, quick thinking there from Pallet. That is why you hold on to your, your skill points. Likely would have started Taunt anyway on the support Shen, uh, but it is something that we did see players kind of fail at a few times throughout play in, where they are actually spending an early skill point, then not being able to actually level up the correct skill to escape any potential invades. But PvB, you know, not going for anything crazy, right? They certainly don't feel that they have to go for any wild invades or level one plans. I do really like that ward from TL. This is specifically to track any potential level two Jarvan gank, any potential red to bot style of play, because TL knows that though PvB wasn't doing anything too crazy in, in game one, they were trying to shake things up on that bottom side and they were really looking to focus that and actually two wards committed. So this should track where Jarvan goes either way, whether he goes to the scuttle, whether he runs straight to bot or trying to go towards mid. Teal giving a lot of respect to that level two from Jarvan. And you have to when you've seen Meliodas play in the play in groups, of course, was incredibly active on this pick, probably his most successful pick overall. And both bot lanes, neither one going to opt to leash for their junglers. Instead, a huge priority on getting that uh, bot wave pushing. Impact and Zero trading back and forth. I love the level up on the heal early from Impact, just to make sure that he doesn't get caught out here. Yeah, I, th I think it is pretty smart. You know, if Aurelia is going to start stun, you can just start oranges and kind of walk at him. Uh, he's looking to just proc the grasp as well as that trial by far, the passive, you know. Uh, being able to put that on, but Meliodas is up here. Now trying to make his way in. Going to flash to oh. try to extend, but going to fail on the EQ extend, and we'll have to walk away empty-handed. So flash for flash trade in the end. Zero still holding on to his. Yeah. Meliodas not quite able to, to really get anything done there. You know, trading flash for flash, not too bad, but certainly not what he was looking for. And Zeros, we'll see if he's going to be able to actually 
run this lane. He certainly wants to be playing aggressively, but it can be difficult if you don't actually have the ability to all in the GP. He's just going to continuously be procking the grass, getting that with the melees, and then queuing you on cooldown over and over and over, whittling you down. I mean, between the inspiration tree, between the healing on his W, as well as the grasp, it feels pretty impossible to all in in a 1v1 short of a lot of uh, mistrades from Impact. But I like that Impact is taking a step back, just giving Aurelia the respect here. Well, and he has to. He has no flash and he has no vision in the river, right? He doesn't know where Meliodas is. Meliodas could be sitting there waiting to actually take him out once again. Smithy down here around mid lane. If they go in, Meliodas likely in position. He's, <laughs> he's not moving, so he hasn't actually been spotted by the Rek'Sai passive. They've been getting oh, hit. Meliodas is right there. The exhaust immediately comes in onto Xmithy. Moving in, Meliodas is going to find the flag and drag. Trying to extend the play. The Ignite has already gone down onto Xmithy. Jensen taking a lot of damage here. Paddle start coming out. Jensen, will they get taken down here? Not going to find it. Now pulling back such a close exchange in the end. The action can continue though. Taunt lands on the bottom side. Now they're going to pull back. The plasma stacks starting to go on to Pal, but not going to get the proc here. Just a bit of aggressive trading. That was honestly fantastic from PVB. Meliodas, right place, right time. Is there for the counter gank, and this is what that matchup Ooh. can look like. Zeros continuing to go forward. Wants one more auto. But oh, the, the comes minions! Up just in time! He leveled up! Barely healing. My god, a game of inches on the top side. I think he would have actually died there had he not leveled up. It looked like the range minions may have been able to finish him off, but just barely surviving. And that is 24 CS to 6 impact put very far down off that early flash being forced. He had to give up so much of the experience. Yes, he will be able to pick up a lot of the gold here, but he had to expend his teleport without much of a buy. So that really is quite a cost. And now Jensen getting caught by the sleep. Sleepy Jensen. Auto's coming through. No, he's not going to chase anymore. Throws the battle star forward, but won't get anything else. Jensen, kind of looking death in the eye there, but we'll walk away as we look back on this play. Yeah, here this is one more time. Zero looking for impact, and in those extended trades, you can just kind of run him down. It's very hard for GP to actually compete with the damage in an extended trade, just barely not taking him down. Both of them living with almost no health. That was 10 HP, 2 HP with a ranged attack in the air when he leveled up. Zero's barely <laughs> surviving, but likewise, Impact lucky to get away with his life there. He had almost no health. Taunt now coming in, though. Poor JJ all alone on the bottom side. No follow-up CC, and the Aftershock is there as well. So we'll just be forced back. We'll force maybe the option not to back here from Core JJ, or we'll desync the bot lane timers. But Meliodas has returned to the top side of the map. Looking for a bit more action here. No flash for either of them. Now stepping forward, Zero's trying to find the stun. Is not going to connect. Meliodas forced to back off. Good movement from Impact to get away. Yeah, Meliodas does show there, and Smithy is up on this top side of the map, so he will be able to try to protect him. And this is a very vulnerable spot for Impact because the wave is building and pushing to his opponent. So you're exposing yourself to any potential ganks and to any potential all-ins from the Aurelia, who has now you know, hit six. No, not quite. You know, is kind of closing in on that. Impact, though, getting the push out here means he can back up at Smithy. Will be the secured crab, so all of TL willing to, uh, in the solo lanes at least, willing to expend some of their own resources, willing to expend some of their own pressure to make sure their jungler can get a lead. Zeros now has to be incredibly careful here. Has burned the flaws to it, may offer an opportunity. I think it's Smithy just there for the counter gank, and making sure that Impact can push out here. Yeah, exactly. He just needs to get it into the turret. As soon as it's in the turret, the wave will stack and push back to you, so you're not then getting permanently denied on that farm. That was the critical part. Now Smithy heading back towards mid lane, but it's more of a battle of vision than anything else as Meliodas and Smithy have really done a good job kind of tracking and battling back and forth. You can see how many wards are in this river for TL. You know, really all the way up along here, but now it's a roam from Core JJ. Core JJ on the way. If he can land the hook, this could change things around. Good bit of damage being laid down from Null. Uses that stolen ignite just to throw down a bit more harass. Smithy not level six yet. Still throwing down, still threatening, however, if they want to go in. Jensen, of course, no really viable ultimate for him to steal here in the mid lane. We'll make things a bit harder. Yeah, he kind of has to wait until he can see Meliodas steal a J4 ultimate, you know, something along those lines. But Core JJ heading back towards the bottom lane. Both two teams, you know, going kind of fairly even in these early stages. And I, I do think for the most part, you're going to be pretty happy about that as TL. The concern is definitely the top lane as, you know, off of those early levels, Impact was forced to flash, did get put in an awkward spot. He does have a lot of farm to pick up here. So as long as he can survive, can continue to maintain, the gap will close between these two carries. And once GP gets to that kind of Triforce stage, you can start one-shotting range minions and it just gets harder and harder 
to really actually punish this guy whatsoever. They're just backing off. Not a lot of mana available, so doesn't want to commit to a full all-in. Most likely would not get enough Blade Surge resets, but Pallet taking a bad end of that trade. Double of Mages look to follow up here. The dash back to safety. Lethal Tempo, though, proc now, and Aura will fire back. And keeping on the top side is Impact. You know, could have Smithy right behind him, right? So when he walks forward like that, you're like, all right, the jungler's here, I'm running, right? <laughs> so, you know, he's kind of bluffing a little bit. You know, Smithy was in that Quandrat on the map, but you can see there's no vision at all around that top side. So how can Zeros play aggressively without, you know, the potential of being punished? And the answer is he can't. So despite the fact that he could potentially have, have all in on impact there, he doesn't have the freedom to do so. And now it is Meliodas down on the bottom oh, side. He's gonna come out. Meliodas is going to follow up, double attack the cleanse, but Core JJ does not. Meliodas immediately going to throw out the ultimate to try to extend the play, but double if just ults to safety. One kill picked up by PVB. They could potentially look for a dive here. No teleports are up. So Smithy is in the area to look to protect double if he wants to pick up this farm, but PVB will not take it further. So it is. First blood to them, very nicely done. Unfortunately, it does go to Pallet, uh, but this is just really, really clean stuff here from Big Coro. They have snuck Meliodas into the back of this brush here, and then Varus just has to hit the ultimate. Once that is there, and Hick confirms the taunt, Hick confirms the knockup, no way out. Doublelift does hold on to the summoner, though, as he is able to use his ultimate to escape from the Jarvins. Good survival play by Doublelift, but Meliodas is starting to come online now that he's level 6. Xmithy with a level 6 as well, so a lot of potential damage from this Rek'Sai if anyone is caught out here. But has not found the opportunity yet. Envision topside very much in favor of PvP, giving Zeros a little bit more freedom to step forward to get aggressive up against Impact. Of course, short trades though, Impact with the Sheen feels like he might just come out on top. Yeah, yeah, he definitely can. I mean, th that's really what you want. You just want a Q and you never want to all-in him unless you can actually get that full-on kill, so... Impact, certainly, I think, back kind of in a comfort zone here. Uh, will be interesting to see if, if he just rushes straight to the Triforce now or if he actually feels like the matchup does warrant going a little bit more defensive. Sometimes you will see him move towards things like early Tabbies, like a Joram's Fist for a little bit more survivability, especially against, you know, J4 plus Aurelia, where you're kind of itemizing for both of them at the same time. I think defensive itemization may pay off for Impact. Of course, level 6 is now passed for both top laners, so while Zeros has a bit more kill pressure on the lane, Impact really can impact anywhere on the map. Mm -hmm. I think Smithy going to do what he can. Tries to find some creative gank pathing, but a well-placed ward will spot him out. And you can see Null is actually moving down. Null is, is looking to actually kind of force this out. Smithy gets an inkling that he may be on vision and does sweep it out. And TL are just going to start up this dragon. They have the ultimate from Impact that will be able to help, so it's kind of like four and a half versus the four. Now the ultimate immediately gonna come out from Boris, use back, it's really not gonna be able to land the Prey Seeker, the fight has already started and kicked off. Impact has killed Pallet, Meliodas in the middle of the team will just get deleted instantly. Good fight from the side of TL, knowing they had the advantage there with the GP ult. Yep, they use that GP ultimate. This is textbook TL stuff. They want to force a 4v4, knowing they're going to have the advantage there. Not only do they go two for one, they get both summoners off of Big Coro. So that is actually a huge win for TL. Oh, Nal now in trouble. Jensen using the ultimate there, but Nal now turning the play. The Shen ult coming out. Jensen needs to get out of here. The flash forward. Pal going to try to find the taunt. Oh! But not going to connect it, but still the kill going down in favor of Nal. Yeah, Pallet a little bit sloppy there, trying to hit with the taunt flash. Either way, they do clean up that kill. That was critical because it was a huge investment. Not only was it the stand united, it was both summoners from Null and the flash from Pallet. So they needed to get that kill. They do it, and they will be able to get a little bit of damage down here. But here's the play one more time. They see Big Coro and Pallet stepping forward. They're separated from the squad. So GP ultimate goes down. Nautilus ultimate goes down. You can see the unfurl on the taunt there from Cynthi. Meliodas moving forward, but he has burst down way too quick, and Big Coro, without the summoners, can't really realistically re-enter the fight. Then one more time, Jensen sees the sleep coming out, is able to dodge and says, hey, I can all in this, and perhaps he could have continued, but Shen ultimate is up, Pallet has respawned, in he comes. Pallet, you could have just actually finished that taunt. The taunt was going to hit, but he tries to go for taunt. And one. the action will not continue as Aurelia TP's in the flash forward on the ulti, trying to find the reset on the core JJ. That's going to be one, two. The blade surge is coming out now. Jensen on the retreat, and there's the top lane impact. The PvP were waiting for, but only a single kill. Yeah, getting down the support still going to feel pretty nice, and they do make impact match with his own teleport. They're going to try to turn this into a dragon here, and that would kind of be the larger prize. Having the extra sustain, you know, both for the Varus and the Zoe especially, to have that additional poke, I think can be quite nice. And if Aurelia wants to sit side lane, being able to have non-stop mana for those Blade Surgers can help out quite a lot. And now a 1.5k gold lead for PvB. TL, once again, falling behind in some of the early stages of this game. And 
And all just continuing to get scarier and scarier. Still does not have the Ludens completed. Double it though. Feeling comfortable on the bot side of the map. Has 9 CS to his name. And is just not apparently scared of the individual 2v2 whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, he had already faced and completed his item. He's on Storm Razor, so he knows they don't want to fight. But here it is, Core JJ looking to get some vision. Face checks Meliodas, and that means TPs can come in. You can see the TP coming out first from Zeros, then from Impact 2 match. Smithy and Impact realizing they're not really going to be able to do much about this fight. So Core JJ does go down. They do bail out. If it was just the support going down, I think TL is honestly totally fine with that kind of trade of summoners for their support's life. But it is the follow-up dragon as well, which does kind of make it a bit sweeter for PvP. Yeah, definitely. Especially when Aurelia has been running completely out of mana, just trying to sustain a push on the top side of the map. will make things a lot more threatening for impact. He does now return to the top side. Of course, a 40 CS difference on the top side of the map. GP, of course, still going to guarantee a lot of late game impact. Uh, I really hate these. I keep rocking into that one. But now, action will continue. Xmithy going to be locked up in the Cataclysm. Nal is here as well. The jungler will get taken out. Another pick. Onto a smithy in the jungle. Yeah, really well done. They're actually taking away the red buff. They're killing him off, stealing away those Krugs now, too. And they will back off. They could have potentially looked for a dive. They're actually going to try it now. 4v1. Shen Alt Power now stepping forward to tank. Impact going to throw down his ultimate. A beautiful flash to make it out to safety. But there's just too many members on the top side. TP coming in as well. Seros within an inch of his life. Jensen wants to keep the fight going. Has the Jarvan ultimate. Meliodas now trying to tank, trying to body block. Double lift is on the way out as well. Seros now getting it taken down. A beautiful turn by TL. Impact is still alive. Core JJ here to extend the fight to Sleepy Trouble Level. Not going to matter because Double Lift is now free. Hitting on Denal. The shutdown going through for Jensen. And Impact fearlessly stepping forward. He wants another shot at Meliodas. Impact with the monstrous outplay there. 1v3. Null didn't think he was even needed. He's heading back to the mid lane. And they're committing everything from Impact. Massive play there from the TL top laner to survive in a 1v3 to get them very low. And it allows TL to fight back at two more kills. They're going to take a tower and a rift plus the kills off this. And now they're in a very, very comfortable position. And in the blink of an eye, the gold is evened up. TL now, even with a small 300 gold advantage for themselves. They were set to take the Rift Herald, but aren't comfortable enough to do it, knowing that they've burned so many of those cooldowns. Bongu Buffalo in response, but let's take a look at this. This is beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I thought this was going to be a 4v1, but you can actually see them mismanaging this dive a bit. A beautiful barrel, then flashes over the taunt from Pallet, avoids the flag and drag, fighting back again through that ultimate, landing the damage down on the zero. So this is just perfectly played here by Impact. You cannot ask for more than that. Double if Jensen roaming up to respond. In comes Core JJ and is allowing them to get another kill here and finish up with that tower. That is a game-changing play there from Impact. Really showing up in this first one. Definitely has, and a game of inches, most certainly one more skill connected. It may have been a different story, but Impact managed to flash it all. And of course, last game, a lot of turret plates went down, a lot of trading, top lane for bot lane towers. This game, it's been a different story, only three plates total, so neither team can generate too much of a gold advantage from that. Yeah, and despite the CS lead for Zeros, Impact's now up in gold. GP prints money with that passive, and he also has some turret gold as well. He has now hit his Triforce. This means you cannot really pressure him solo under the turret ever again. He's going to be able to just one-shot the range minions, clear out those waves so easily. Oh, play though on the top side. Ultimate expended from Big Koro. Arrow going to come out as well, but not a lot of damage yeah. there, not a lot of effect. I think they thought they could get more out of oh, that. That's going to be a lot, though. The Cataclysm coming out. Double is immediately going to use the ultimate to make it to safety. Still, of course, has the flash available. Core JJ in trouble. Stopwatch buys a bit more time. PVB have the Herald as well. Could look to take down the top side, but you got two members roaming up from the side of Team Liquid. If they keep trying to go for this play, Meliodas is walking into enemy territory. And remember, there's no tower, so they can commit to this. Ultimate coming up from Rex Ix with you right in the middle of everyone, but Meliodas immediately going to flash the GPL coming in. Jensen on the backside, going to continue forward. Jen trying to use Meliodas as an escape route. Will not be able to make it out. The knockout coming in just in time. Absolute destruction. Team Liquid cutting through PvB. Yeah, they committed so much to taking down Core JJ, and they were able to do it. But again, Impact alting from the side lane, contributing from down in that bottom lane. Jensen and the rest of the team are roaming up. So here it is one more time. Varus Ultimate was already down. They wanted to go for a vision play, but they do trap in Core JJ. Double is though able to get Meliodas very low. Would have killed him despite, you know, that, that 3v2 if it weren't for the stopwatch. So good stopwatch from Meliodas, but then Smithy able to tag with the Prey Seeker, goes in with the ultimate. Jensen using the Abscond of Duck to get over the wall to come in, try to clean up Meliodas, who barely is able to survive thanks to dodging out on that skill shot. 
but it is the stolen Varus ultimate there locking down Big Koro and getting them another kill. And just a fantastic turn from TL. Once again, start of the day, Coach Kane said, hey, we are willing to play more aggressive. We want to try more aggressive. They weren't able to pull it off in game one. It was a slower game when they got control. But this game, mm -hmm. they are matching pace with Fongbu Buffalo. We thought these situations that were chaotic, that were constant, where the pace would just continue to ramp up and up may not favor Team Liquid, but they are going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and they're looking good doing it. Yeah, they certainly are. And they're kind of back in their wheelhouse now where they can just be one for always have impact in the side lane, always have him drawing pressure. If you send members up to him, great. He's just going to try to survive. But it is three members from PPB looking to get up here. Impact sniffing this one out, though, will back off as the Rift Herald is getting dropped. You can spot that on the minimap. So they will be losing their top turret. We'll see if they want to try to make a stand for Tier 2. They have traded back one turret, but the base from Corey DJ tells me they're going to try to make a concerted effort to keep up their second tower. Yeah, Demolish proc now combined with the Herald charge as well. Impact. Pretty easily clear this wave, of course, with the barrels, but does not have his ultimate available. We'll try to hit some of the creeps. Still, the Riptail Charge will go off, taking about 40% of that tower's health. Merlio is taking the red buff as well. So small advantages extending here for PVB, but have to be careful they don't get caught out in the fight. Teleport wards behind them if they want to use it, but it's a TP coming in for Fongu Buffalo. Three members caught in the pinch. Where's the ulti going to go? Meliodas waiting. Zeros in the midst of the team, but only going to connect on the support. Has to reset, but out comes the Rexai. Pallet dashing over to safety with an inch of his life. Double is trying to get the fight, but doesn't have the opportunity. PVB so far winning out. Eyes on Double of Boys. He's going to go immediately into the backside, but cannot enter any further. Big Koro and Nal are untouched. Impact grabs a double, but PVB continue to pressure forward. Yeah, three for two there for PVB. Really nice play. Double wasn't really with the team. He wasn't able to actually be involved in that fight from the get-go. So despite the fact that Impact had a good ultimate, that he was able to get in there, PVB make the proactive play. They are more together as a team on it. And as a result, come out one kill ahead. And had Double not been able to clean up one additional one, that could have been pretty disastrous for them. But here it is one more time. TL, four men on the top side, moving over. Pallet says, hey, we can actually turn on this. The TP's immediately coming through from zero, and you can see Double on the minimap. He was out in mid lane, clearing the wave. So it's Zoe much faster to arrive. Just now is Double getting here, as two of his teammates have already gone down. He does alt in to try to clean one up, tag Zeros with that W. Really nice shot from him there to get one back. But PVB, another proactive play does cost them their teleport, but they do go plus one. Impact now with TP advantage, as well as the beneficiary of two of those kills. So in terms of the individual top lane 1v1, things continue to get harder and harder for Zeros. But the rest of PvP do now have priority in the mid lane and will be able to grab the first mid lane tower of the game. The Demolish Clock hits. Smithy and Core JJ there to pick up the resources, make sure the double can grab them as well, but nothing else is going to come from play. Yeah, nicely done, though. PvP staying proactive. They always seem to know what the next step is, which is something that is really impressing me about them in this series. TL certainly still very comfortable in this position. They have impact in a great spot where he has been, you know, as you say, the beneficiary of some of these kills. He's still ahead of the Aurelia just barely and working towards like what is that Sterics? But they're going for an all in. Been coming out with the TP already coming in on the opposite side. Pallet is here as well. They desperately want to kill Impact before he gets there. Now they a stolen Shen ulti keeping Impact alive. They're continuing to extend the play. Impact will get taken down. And now Jensen is caught in the middle of the team. If he can't use the Kingmaker, he may just go down in the exchange. A lot of initial damage. Jensen manages to turn the play. Pallet now in trouble. The turn from Jensen, the double dropping. Huge play coming out of Jensen there. The TP coming through. The Shen ulted by time. Had Impact had his ultimate up a little bit earlier, that could have been a slaughter. But PvB do get it turned around on them. They do kill off Impact, thankfully for them. But they do lose two. They will lose the mid lane turret off the play. And Jensen is getting so, so big on this Silas. Oh, big Coro now in trouble. The immediate flash follow, the ulti follow for double lift, picking up an easy kill in the mid lane. Well played by Xmithy. Meliodas gonna try to turn it back. Null on the way in, but the bubble does not go through the wall. It's gonna turn the shutdown. Coming in, PVB have overstepped. Miss execution as Null does not connect the bubble. Yeah, I don't really think Meliodas had any chance of really making that work, to be honest with you. Yes, there was a Zoe in his back pocket, but that was a, a 3v2. Double lift still had summoners. He was still basically full on health. There was no one that they could just instantly pick off. Now your juggler is down. TL are going to start up the Baron. And this could again be the straw that breaks the camel's back. They will be moving up, but Zeros is on bot side of the map. He doesn't have his teleport. Ooh, Jensen going to get tagged out there. Hex Flash going to come over the wall. How we'll see it coming. 2K and dropping the first Baron of the game. Going to go over to Team Liquid uncontested. Null now needs to retreat. Impact Ultimate now coming out. Null running for his life. Jensen going over the wall, finding yet another kill. Eyes on Zeros. Maybe a miracle play, but it's simply too difficult. Too much CC on the enemy team. Will he even try? Will he throw out the ultimate? 
The rest of the team now coming. Big Coro there as well, but no ultimate for the Varus. And Jensen just slowly whittling away at this health bar. He has to be careful. He gets pulled back to the team. So many blade reset opportunities, but they're not going to happen. Big Coro, though, remains uncontested. Double it. Now going to be in trouble. Meliodas moving forward. Double it. Taken out. PVB want to extend this fight. The shutdown on the double it. Big Coro, though, now going to be in trouble. Impact over the wall. The barrel is there. Oh. The triple kill for the Varus, but Impact finds one back as the barrel takes him down. Does go four for three for TL plus the bear in there. PVB a bit out of sorts. After that bot lane play did not go their way, trying to overforce in the mid lane does punish them heavily. They've now lost the Baron. It is on impact, which is very critical. It stays up on Smithy as well. So they're gonna have one Baron with the main squad, wearing one Baron in that side lane also. And TL getting chased down here, they make the call to turn, immediately bursting down Zeros. So but Big Coro is untouched critically here and still very, very healthy. So Big Coro flashing forward, knocking down double. This means TL has to retreat. They're looking for the turn, but Impact out of vision, barrel over the wall, knocks him down, does get another shutdown there. And in the meantime, TL did grab a dragon. So extending that advantage and it's going to take big plays, it feels like, from PvP to really get back into this one. And the good news for them, Azael, as Team Liquid are now set to take control with the two minutes remaining on this Baron power play, is you know they have a Zoe. They have champions that can set up these big picks, these big moments, but it's going to be difficult. Gangplank continuing to get stronger and stronger at the two-item point. Rek'Sai now, both of them with the Steric Gauge, going to be very difficult to actually burst out. Yeah, really hard to burst out, and Jensen going to be closing in on his Zonius, right? So that makes him harder to take down. Doublelift could very easily go for PD if he's worried about the dive there too. So, you know, the options get harder and harder, and the extended fights should go the way of TL. We'll see, though. There is a Baron buff in two lanes, as expected here from TL. Looks like they want to make the collapse down towards the bottom side, and while Nall can certainly get picks on the Zoe, it requires vision. It requires TL to not really be able to see him. So that is kind of what they are missing. They need to create these pockets of vision to be able to get that damage down. And without it, you can expect TL to continue to kind of close in on them and try to strangle out this game. Now they're going to try to extend the play, though. Once again, immediately going to go in. That's going to be the Blade Search reset. Double up, making out over the wall. Impact most likely set to fall, but so much damage coming in from the GP ultimate. Jensen now on the way in as well. Double Can't it. away in ultimate. Big Coral locked up, caught out. The Zhonya's going to fade away, and he will now go down. No chance to get anything as Impact will find yet another kill. Yeah, Teal get a little bit sloppy there and do kind of walk into one of those few pockets where they did not have vision, but they are able to turn around the fight. The Sterics making it so hard to take down this tanky GP. TL will claim the first inhibitor. Smithy already pushing in the mid lane for the second inhibitor. And this game's looking done. Stolen ultimate coming out. Chain CC follow-up is there for Team Liquid. They're barreling down now the bottom side of the map. The Baron empowered minions are there. Zeros immediately eliminated the double kill coming through for Jensen. And while it was shaky in game one, TL have asserted absolute dominance here on the back of so many incredible individual plays in game two. TL will move up to match point in the series. Yeah, very well played game number two here from Team Liquid. Really looking comfortable. And I have to give so much credit to Impact for the pressure he withstood in that top lane, playing incredibly well from a deficit where he was forced to burn his flash very early on in a difficult position where the lane was pushing away from him, where he was going to have to give up a lot of CS, and he does hang on, he does survive, and he was massive in turning around a lot of those fights with the ultimate, and also in surviving the 1v3 that was yeah, just Yeah, that dive I think we could rewatch so many times because he dodges so much CC with a single flash, barely manages to survive, and it was absolutely on the top side, a very close, he almost went down to that Aureli all-in, did yeah. not fall. Aureli lived with 2 HP, he Oof. had like maybe 20. <laughs> so absolutely brutal. Well, game two went the way of Team Liquid, and to hear more about how it shook out, let's send it over to the State Farm Analyst Desk. Thank you, Dracos. The score now sits two to zero in favor of Team Liquid as they pick up another win here. This side, or this time rather, from the red side. Uh, something that jumped out to me immediately, though, in this game was that every single player across the board, all ten of them, were playing a different and new champion as compared to the first game of the series. So a, a total switch up. How did it play out? Well, that was the weird thing was you saw the draft and you're like, okay, it is a total switch up. They're probably not going to play around bot side that much. You have a Shen and a carry top into a GP, which is the most telegraph, like, we're going to dive top probably this game. And then it didn't happen. So, like, it was <laughs> a very weird, like, oh, the draft pivot makes sense, but the gameplay pivot didn't match it. Right. Well, so let's dive straight into some of those replays then. Let's take a look at how things broke down for PvB throughout the game, starting near the Drake. 
So I just have to throw this one all out there that like, I understand they like to fight. They like to skirmish. It feels like everything's about this bot lane. Why in the world is PVB fighting on their bot side with their semi-global ultimate? They have a Shin. They fight with the Shin instead of across from it to make access of the advantage of having Shin TP to them. And then you add the extra element onto it. Their top laner doesn't have teleport at the time and they're against a gangplank. What? What is happening? Like, I totally want to go, yes, when a, when a team throws, someone has to catch it. So all credit to Impact. You did an amazing job. You definitely punished that throw. You smeared, pushed their faces down in it. But ultimately, what was happening with that pathing? Why did no one help Saros in the top lane? He built like a 40 CS by himself. Where was the dive? I, I don't know. They, I they, tilted. They, they went up there like once pre 10 minutes and then the, the whole rest of the game plan seemed to be focused around bot lane. And then they finally start putting their, their in, you know, top again. And you know, good job by Impact flashing the, the taunt that's gonna come out here, making sure he's gonna stay alive. You know, super clean, all that. Has the speed up from his Q landing, so he's faster, can get away from stuff. But at the same time, it's like, this is such a late attempt. It gets countered out initially, and the rest of the team was already rotating up. Kais is already on the top side of the map. Like, if you had done this before, you know, the map had started opening up a little bit more, people had an easier time getting out of lanes. You could have blown open that 40 CS lead. I mean, it, it's at this point where I'm watching the game where I'm like, PVB will never take a game. Like, they can take moments within this series, but this is, just makes me feel so much more confident about this 3-0 call for Team Liquid. Because I'm like, you had all of the opportunity, you have all of the setup, but you couldn't recognize what the proper win conditions were for the moment to execute right. on it. And then if you just even, like, that was a boosted dive. You go for that type of dive, and Impact is just styling on you. And then turns it around, and suddenly GP is massive here when you had every opportunity to put him down. Right. I think you look at this and you go, we saw on that, on that lower third, 45 CS lead for Saros at 15 minutes, done almost entirely by himself. And at that point is the first time the team plays towards the win condition of strong carry laner into weak carry laner uh, in that sense to try and take advantage of it. And they, that probably could have been the fourth or fifth time in a game if they had chosen to play that way earlier. Yeah, and I mean, they, they pick up a lot of kills around the map. Like, you can see the skill of the players and, and all that. And, you know, the draft makes a lot of sense too. It's just like when it comes down to like, what is the decision making around where you want to spend your resources and where you want to go to? It clearly falls apart because they that was still a pretty close game for you know 15, 20 minutes of it, despite how much we're criticizing PVB's decision making. That's that's the key word for me. It's the decision making. Because in the reactive 1v1 mechanics, we know that PVB's members have it, but it's making the right call at the right time. Yeah, and this is just kind of the the final icing on the cake, it feels like a little bit, where you're finally still not playing around the right side of the map. You're attacking the bot lane that has a long lane behind them and the GP. So, you know, you get that first kill onto the enemy support, great. Now the other people are collapsing. They have a better path because your turret's down and the GP all, which will come in as well. And this was kind of the point in the game, I guess, where it was like, okay, Team Liquid are probably finally going to win after it, having it pretty close for a while. Yeah, it's kind of like the last cherry on top that it was going to be a, a steamroll from here. And now I'm just curious, like heading into the next game, you know, do PVB try to run that same type of type of draft again? Because I was like, okay, they're finally going to play around Zeros. They've ignored him for two games. When are you finally going to go back to what has worked with you, which is your carry top laner? Right. I think that that is the real question here, right? You have you have two paths in front of you. Uh, the first is to go back to game one strategy in which you pick to contest maybe across the board and play towards the bot lane and match TL a little bit more one for one and just try to prove that you are better. Your other option is to is to play what you played here in game two, but actually make decisions that align with you know the the arsenal of weapons that you've armed yourself with. And I I don't want to spoil this. Did Team Liquid choose uh, blue side? Blue side. Okay. So I mean, it's going to be a different draft, but now you have the red side uh, last pick advantage, so you could potentially find something top lane to try and exploit to re repeat that style. But there's no way he's there's not a guarantee he's going to play GP again. So he can play something more stable and be like, okay, well. You can't beat us by going bot. You didn't go top enough here. Like, I don't know what you want to do. Unfortunately, I feel like, at least in this series and on this day, that if PVB start to run away with the game, it's because Team Liquid made the wrong call and pushed into them instead of just backing up. Because I feel like throughout yeah. this entire series, it, it's TL that are saying, let's fight this, let's not fight this. And their decision making is what's lowering the variance on kind of the volatility of these matches. And I mean, the story for Team Liquid, for this this whole split for them, has always been like, well, we don't make the big mistake. Right. You know, they almost never make the big mistake. And so these games get a little scrappy. We've seen this time and time again. And then the enemy team makes the big mistake and Team Liquid just obliterates you at that point. Team Liquid, that's been their MO all season is like, you'll get some shots in at us, but you will never 
beat us at 25 minutes when we're in control. And so that's what's happened two games in a row, and they don't seem to be making those big mistakes like Frost is saying. So it does feel like the third game is, is a tough battle for Feng Vu. Very much so. TL has some cushion with that 2-0 lead for Feng Vu Buffalo. They got to put three together, just like Team Liquid did in their regional finals. Team Liquid are one win away from earning their spot in groups. We'll see if